the people who fought for our freedom were not cops, or wealthy white city officials, or gun-toting libertarians, or glad-handing politicians looking to get our votes. They were hustlers, injection drug users, people who lived on the streets. They were black and brown, butches, queens, and trans women who do not have the option to decide that their struggles were just about gay rights. The people who fought for our freedom took care of each other, creating safe places to be themselves when, when, <clears throat> when the white gays, the white middle class assimilationist motherfucking gays took over the movement later with their assimilationist goals, kicked them out because they wouldn't act grateful for the scraps given to them by the racist politician, racist police forces, and racist housing policies. Yeah. Yeah. Despite the persistent efforts by many white people, including so-called allies, to turn the conversation of, about race from a conversa away from a conversation about black life, away from a conversation about police brutality, and away from a conversation about the white supremacy that lives and breathes within every single white person standing here right now, I refuse to shut my mouth and let white people set this agenda. <laughs> at this meeting and there was a particular faculty member who was uh, instigating much of the tension around race at Evergreen. And she was there, she tended to go to these things. And we were discussing the question, there were all of these allegations about white supremacy at Evergreen and every so often somebody, sometimes it was me, sometimes it was somebody else, asked about okay, where is this white supremacy? Can we, can we see it? Can we evaluate it? And this faculty member said that, she said, to ask students who are suffering from white supremacy to tell us about the instances of white supremacy is itself racism. Um, and she said, we must stop asking them because we are inflicting harm on them, asking for evidence. And the phrase she used, she said, to ask for evidence of racism is racism with a capital R. And as she said, racism with a capital R, she leaned forward in her seat and she looked directly at me. And I had been leaning back in my chair. There was no opportunity to ask questions in these meetings. I sat up in my chair and I said, are you talking to me? And she said, yes. And I looked around the room and nobody said a word. And I said, you know, at some point, you might want to check into whether or not my history lines up with the accusation of racism because you might be very surprised. And if you don't look into it, it's going to come back to bite you. And the chair of the faculty said, Brett, this is not the place to defend yourself against accusations of racism. And I said, that's fine. Where is the place? And then the faculty member who leveled the accusation says, you should not expect a place to defend yourself against accusations of racism. And I looked around the room. The president of the college is sitting there. The provost of the college is sitting there. Nobody says a word. And I said, whoa. What faculty was she a part of? What was, was she teaching at the time? Naima was in media studies and film was her, her bag. We, we've caught, we sort of coined this term of a phrase called black girl in the wilderness, right? Sort of to describe this profound isolation we feel as these sort of unruly, loud mouthed women with like the wrong hair and a lot of attitude and a rabid dedication in our work towards education as an actually liberatory practice, right? We both teach in places we get in trouble sometimes. Or we don't get in trouble until we're actually doing what we say we're gonna do, then we get in trouble. At some point, what I realized was that in order to not feel alone in the work, I had to take the risk, right, of doing some of this, what Bell Hooks calls engaged pedagogy. 
that make sense? For those of you who either have or do not have a card, what you're doing, right? When you hear your number, say your thing, say it loud. I might ask you to repeat it if it's not loud enough. I'm that teacher. Yes? OK. OK, one. How do you know you are white? Is that one? Two. Have you always been white? Three. Four. Five. Six. Twenty-six. Twenty-seven. Do you think about being white when you wake up in the morning? Twenty-eight. Do you think about being white when you go to bed at night? Twenty-nine. Do you think about being white while you're eating? Thirty. 35. What do white people love? 36. Do white people love you? 37. Do you love white people? 38. Do you have to be white to be loved? 39. What does love have to do with you? Okay. I don't know that she does or doesn't believe that we're all guilty of racism, but I know that she understands the power of saying such a thing. And that's really what this is about for her was power. Yeah, she's an extremely smart, actually postmodernist cynic. I contact the provost and I said, uh, you know, you, you heard that she accused me of racism. And he said, well, she's right, isn't she? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, we're all guilty, aren't we? And I said, no. Ken, what are you talking about? No, that's not accurate. Ignorance, maybe. Maybe, you know, we're all going to have some ignorance about other people's experience. No doubt I have ignorance about what it's like to be black or a woman or gay or any of these things. But racism? No, that's not, it's not true that it's universal. It was like somebody had said the most, the oddest thing to him. Like, you're really arguing that we're not all guilty of racism? I actually think racism depends on white people being really, really nice to everybody and just carrying on, right? Just be really nice and just carry on. Um, and nothing will change or get interrupted and you will be supporting the default uh, and the default is the reproduction of, of white, whiteness and white supremacy. And we need to go back to where that relentless self-reflection, humility um, and grappling Right? Where, where am I not understanding something and how might I be accountable to that? So what do student protesters want? This was gathered um, around all the recent protests that have happened on college campuses. And the number one is increase the diversity of the professors. And that's why I think it's really important to focus there because we often want to kind of, how do I get my students to understand this? And that is critical, but that is functioning to have us not look at ourselves as faculty. And so anyway, you, you can see all of these. And actually, I know that um, your institution is um, working and struggling right, to, to move this forward and is putting together a cabinet. Is that correct? A council, right? And I think as that happens, um, the racism that's embedded will surface more and more. One of the other challenges to this work is that we think when we start to talk about it and then it starts to surface, some, sometimes we think that us talking about it or caring about it or centering it is what's causing the problem. And I would say, no, you, you finally created a space for all that people have had to sit on and endure to come to the surface. Denny graduated from Evergreen in 1973 and later served with us on the Board of Trustees uh, during difficult periods in which the college faced the major financial challenges I mentioned. And as my, fellows, as my, as my, fellows test, my fellow trustees will attest, Denny's... Okay. Don't be uncomfortable. This is your time. It's not yours either. Okay, so this is a message from a student. Um, here's their statement. My name is Caro Gonzalez. I am in Standing Rock. I am a grainer. Fuck your neoliberal bullshit to make this school run like a corporation. Fuck raising tuition, catering the racists, homophobes, transphobic, bigots, neo-Nazis, rapists. Fuck you. Y'all are putting us into debt. 
Y'all are stealing our money. This school is unsafe for marginalized students, and you know it. The students have the power in universities. We can strike, we can boycott, we can divest. From you, from Evergreen, we can occupy the classrooms and refuse to leave and to pay until we get what we demand, a fair and good and affordable and accessible education. Tell me right now how you'll take action. I want to thank President Bridges and the Board of Trustees for um, this wonderful honor. And to all of my friends, the staff and the faculty, but most importantly, the students here at Evergreen that I've had the honor of being able to work with, to argue with, to educate, to enjoy over these many, many years. Then why don't the faculty and staff represent us? And, and um, I'm, I'm, more than well, I'm more than willing to yes. answer, a quest, answer a question, but let me finish my comments. I'll honor you, you honor me. Thank you. Now, Are we going to do, though? Do, and I will listen. Dr. King stated that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. Dr. King and, is also dead. So and, my questions are, while you were president here, what did you do for like the black students on campus? What did you do for the LGBTQ people on campus? What did you do for the Latina X people on campus? What did you do? You keep talking about race and everything and like, oh, you look back to your grandparents, blah, blah, blah. But like, what did well, you do for us? It's, what did you do for, for the it, people on excuse campus? Excuse me, it's not back to my grandparents, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm just, yeah. I, it's, it's not back to my grandparents, blah, blah, blah. It's not. It's the core of our foundation of who we are. I, I get it, the anger. I get it that you want responses and you deserve them. But you, have to, but you have to interact. You have to interact with people that are committed like you are to it. Just because I have a suit on now, have more than a year, but it's kind of nice to have it on again. <laughs> but just because I, 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 I'm, I'm that, and that's been my life, and my life is passing, you have to, one, learn wisdom from elders, and educate elders as well. But you have, we have to find the foundation to open the door for the conversation, people. We have to find a way to do that. That's what it's about, students. And here today, when you honor me with this building, I want to say thank you. If this building has my name, where students will walk through it to be educated, to have seminars, to argue, to resolve conflicts, that will make all the difference in my heart with my name on this building because that is what it should do and that is what it's designed to do and it's wonderful that we have an environment where that can happen so with that i just want to say thank you to all my friends and staff and thank you for Day of absence is a tradition that nobody really explained to us when we showed up at Evergreen. It was never an important feature in our quadrant of the college. In the sciences, I don't think there was wide participation. I don't actually remember a single student in my whole history at the college being absent on the day of absence. Do you? No. So, day of absence ostensibly was a day on which originally black faculty and students, and then later people of color more generally, would absent themselves from the college in order to emphasize the importance of the roles they were playing at the college. Some of the events scheduled on day of absence were a bunch of little seminars, and they were things like how Asians contribute to white supremacy. Like this was one of the topics of the day, and the others were comparable, all of which you would recognize from the work that you've done. All the grievance studies sort of turned into seminars. Commitments to participate in Day of Absence this year were encouraged by the administration, and then it was revealed 
to the faculty as a whole that day of absence this year meant white people don't show up to campus. Mm -hmm. And at the point this became clear, I sent an email to the campus, well, to faculty and staff, and on the staff list were, I think, some 500 students who had staff positions at the college, and I said, this is unacceptable. It's one thing to absent yourself, it's another thing to tell other people to go away on the basis of their skin color. You should expect me to be present on the day of absence as a protest, because I, I won't be told not to show up to a public college because I'm white. Um, this caused a certain amount of uproar over email, I should say, though, that that email caused the usual 15 to 20 suspects on staff and faculty who are hateful to send bile-filled, angry emails accusing you of all manner of things that you had not done and are not. In the email, I offered to hold a seminar for anybody interested on the evolutionary meaning of racism, where it comes from, why it exists. If we're going to have this discussion, by all means, let's have it full strength with the proper scientific underpinnings. And this was dismissed as scientific racism, as if I was somehow going to, you know, hold a seminar claiming that white people were superior or something like this. There was definitely talk of white fragility. There, I think you were encouraged to read, is it Robin DiAngelo's That's book? white fragility. Did they at any point talk about epistemic exploitation? No. Because that's exactly that. where uh, to ask for evidence. Yeah. And make, oh, that's exactly what they call that. That's exactly that little trap. Yeah. Exactly what grievance studies is doing, based in the postmodern tradition that you know better than I do, it's completely discordant with a scientific understanding of the world. There is an objective reality or there isn't. We're not talking, we're not speaking to whether or not we'll ever get there, even. We're not, that's not what we're doing. That's, you know, that's what we do as scientists and what we are supposed to be doing as scholars, is figuring out, okay, which of these methods is a better way to actually approach, approach reality. But it's just completely discordant. Science has at its core, you know, hypothesis and falsifiability and testability, and so they gotta be the first to go. A student who I knew pretty well called me over and she said, um, do you know that there are people outside that door chanting for you to be fired? Now, if you're not 
listen to me. Yes, I know. History puts history puts people in their place. Your actions. Yes, I know. History puts history could pivot in the direction of the values that you are standing here for. Yeah, resign. What? Resign. Resign. Okay. If I owe an apology, I will deliver it. Wait, hey. Wait. Excuse me. So, wait, hold on. Can I get this straight? You were coming over here for Brett Weinstein because you were... I got information you thought... being cornered by students. Oh, okay, but not over here. Not being Okay, maybe you should have gotten better information. I, I only get limited information. Oh, okay, so well, we were in D. It's a very okay. small campus. We are not blocking him in any way. Okay, there was room to leave. What's that? There was, there was room. room there was like there was one group of students on one side of him, yeah. and then a small dispersed group on the other side. One of the main protesters somehow managed to get all of the upper admin of the college, the president, the, all the VPs, most of the deans, if not all of them, plus various other members of the administration, sitting in a closed room with. 8, 10, 12 protesters. But the police deliberately pushed past white students to target people of color. We deliberately asked white students to be a barrier between the police because we know the relationship that black and brown people have with the police. They made an effort to push them out of the way to get to us when everyone was doing the same thing. So to me, that feels like targeting black and brown people. And you can't tell me that that's not targeting black people because we have the evidence on camera mm -hmm. that they literally pushed white people out of the way to attack black and brown bodies. Please show me that video. So I want you to really sit with that when you go home and you kiss your white kids. Remember that you did that to us. You stuck us out in the cold. Your silence is white violence. Yeah, I was waiting to say that this whole mm -hmm. White silence is violence. Y'all need to understand that. But we have no, sitting aside, but we don't have any legal your, way to claim that. Letting your coworkers, letting your students go through this, like that's violence. Sure. I was gonna say, I don't understand how the diversity and equity plan was presented as this thing that people had to get on board with at this campus if you got paid by this campus and then turn, like, then it's turned around and then you get to send out all these emails about it. It just doesn't make sense to me why he's still here if this was something you had to get on board with. I believe the equity plan is a great plan. I also know that in every organization, in every school I've been a part of, there are always people who don't buy in. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, a problem is, they have an opportunity to speak their mind. Even sometimes they do it in the most offensive ways. Mm -hmm. And how do we stop people from speaking offensively? That's a challenge. There is this concept of free speech. Mm -hmm. Now, if it constitutes a hate crime, if it's targeting a certain population, then we got then we got a point of leverage. Can there be any, is there any way to word some sort of language about the commitment towards um, really targeting STEM? And a lot of this, like everyone needs all of this, but like Regard, like regarding targeting like science, like science. sciences as far as like education about like these kind of issues, because like it. If that's the place where it's like happening like the most consistently, I think there needs to be something written down that's like like even extra emphasis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on like addressing those teachers. They're gonna say some things that we don't like and our job is to bring them on. Mm -hmm. Or get them out. Right. And um, what I hear us stating that we are working toward is bring them in, train them, and if they don't get it, sanction. Right. Bring them in train them, and if it doesn't take, sanction them. And then he says to the protesters, I want you to hold me to that. All right, so that's the plan, is for people like me, bring them in, train them, and if it doesn't take, sanction them. This is the mechanism that they're going to use to force this change to the college. Good. You gotta put your hands up. You know you gotta put your hands up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ike! Yes, Ike! <laughs> <laughs> and let me remind y'all, that's how whiteness works. Whiteness is the most 
violent fucking system to ever breathe. It's not, it's not an accident. It's not an accident that all of our administration is white. Right. It's not an accident. That shit is systematic as fuck. So while we sit up in here acting like this conversation is gonna change shit, y'all know what changes shit? Action. That's why the fuck we in this room. Right. Meeting at four o'clock in the up, upper floor of the library building in this old cafeteria was extremely dangerous and ill-considered. In approaching the meeting, uh, one goes down a hallway on this fourth floor, and the hallway is completely controlled by anarchists. At the point that I show up, they assign somebody to me to mind my every move. There's food that has been supplied by the college, the state college, and the announcement is made that the food is for people of color only. Food, water. The chairs are also uh, to be reserved for people of color. Uh, then it turns out there are enough chairs, so white people are allowed to sit in the back. In the back, yeah. So I, you know, I hear this announced, and I, you know, it, it is one of, of, of many hard to imagine things. What are you gonna do? Right now, I don't care about a plan. I'm talking about action. Because if it was your kids, you would be doing hell and high water. For Woo! Woo! I will commit. I will commit to dealing with my own shit. My own racism. Okay. Thank you. of my students, students of color, actually stand up and try to speak on my behalf at this meeting. We listen to what the people said, what he did, and maybe we should also listen like what the people like supporting him and like what uh, like he said. Because like as I know, it's like he's very anti-racist. Who? Hey, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Response is to chastise them as if they who do know me have misunderstood something and need to be re educated. Shana, Shana. Uh, so, as a person, as, like, as people of color, we have to recognize that like, we're not black and we do not know the black experience, and so we can't really. We have to recognize that also, as people of color, we are also anti black. And we can't speak to him. Thank you, Thank you. 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 with our younger son. So I got a voicemail from a dean. Hey, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. I know you're on sabbatical. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, something's happened in Brett's classroom. I, I just, I'm, che I'm checking in. I'd really like to talk to you or Brett and um, 
you know, there might be media interest in the story. So I just want to tell you, I just want to assure you that the college can deal with any media interest that comes your way. I didn't know that Brett was okay, but the message that I got from the college that I've been employed at for 15 years was the most important thing here is that we are in control of this story. Charges against Army. 